Again, Emily Homer has been here for our uh, sessions this year. She's been live in Oregon for our conferences. Uh, she's been leading our se uh, series on echo and uh, for safe swallowing and feeding in schools all year. These sessions have been recorded and will be watched by teams uh, in the years to come. Again, Emily, thank you so much for being part of Oregon's uh, past, present, and future You're and welcome, supporting Deborah. our most vulnerable kids. And thank you for your innovative way of looking at professional development, because I, I think this was such a unique but wonderful way to get information to people in small digestible doses. And I think the format and that is wonderful. And I, I think you'll have a great year next year with the topics you've been uh, the people have identified, I think you're just going to keep moving forward. So that's very exciting. Wonderful. Thank you for including me in it. So okay. go right ahead and, and oh, can I go ahead and share. Okay. Yes, please do. All right, good. Let's see. Let me find my PowerPoint. Okay. All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and get started then. And we are uh, seeing your screen, just giving you okay, verification. Perfect. So here we are ending our year with getting started, which is kind of a, a crazy thing. I, I wanna begin by thanking you guys for attending for throughout the year. And for those of you who now at the end of your school year, the beginning of your summer, you're still making the time to come. And uh, that is remarkable and quite impressive. Um, so hopefully you will get a lot out of today's session, I, I'm hoping. Um, so here are my disclosures, which you've seen many times. So today we're going to try to talk about taking all that information we talked about during the school year and really coming out with a little plan for how you're going to get started if you haven't started or if you have started how you can adjust what you're doing um, so we're really kind of listening this time a little differently I, I want you to listen with a new or a different ear um, I don't you're not so much taking in information as digesting sorting through it and coming up with your own personal action plan on what you can do to come up with a, you know, a really high quality swallowing and feeding procedure in your district or districts, because I know some of you go to more than one, in your schools or in whatever your situation is. So you're going to have to sift through the information. Some of it you will, will have already done and it's not an issue for you and others will say okay that's the area I need to work on so I'm hoping that by the time we filter through all these uh, slides and we talk about them that you will walk away with a real plan on how to improve what you're already doing or how to start something that hasn't been started um, and so of course interaction is always such an important part of this uh, series and so feel free to unmute and ask a question or to raise your hand and Deborah will and you know acknowledge you or tag it in chat um, so that we can really finish the year with a something concrete in your hand. Um, so of course the very first step is really where we started at the beginning of this series and that's the uh, approval of a district supported team procedure. The administrative support piece is so essential that I can't really say it enough. So you need to determine who is the top administrator who will, you will be going to with questions regarding feeding and swallowing. More than likely, it would be your supervisor of special education, but you may have different people that function in different ways than districts I'm used to. So you'll know who that person is. You'll have to seek out who that is and share information to them on why districts really need to. Now, you know, we went through that in the foundations. We talked in detail about why districts must be doing this. And it just seems to be getting more and more important as I read cases in different states where children have choked. You know, so it's more important now than ever that we really look at the reasons why and let those top administrators who have a hundred things on their plate 
just to focus on this one thing for a minute and realize how important it is. Um, so then we you, you also need to think about, well, what is that top administrator's role in ensuring that the procedure is successful? Well, they're real important for personnel issues. So if you're adding something that is this time intensive, perhaps they need to talk about adding personnel or redistributing personnel. There's training issues that we know exist. Um, there's training on the procedure, and then there's also updating skills training, which of course this organization does such a great job of. There's compliance concerns that administration would need to be uh, involved in, health and safety concerns, and as well as whenever there's issues or concerns from parents. Uh, so working with your administration is one of the most effective things you can do to get a high quality swallowing and feeding procedure in place. Once you've done that, then you need to step back and look and say, who can administrate all that's happening with this team effort? Now, for those of you who to go to a number of different districts, um, you may have a team administrator at one, uh, and then you, it, the other district may be so small that maybe just a core team is addressing it and they keep track of everything. It, it will look different. So where are you in this process with the team administrator? Are you in a larger school district that really is going to need a team administrator to assign teams and team leaders? If there's many schools in the district, this is a really important part. Who is a team that is gonna be addressing it? Um, they need, you need that person to collect data on the students, to keep track of the students that are being followed, uh, including who the teams are, the team leader, that they have a current swallow and feeding plan, that you know if they transfer to another school, there's no interruption in those services, that the receiving team really knows what to do and knows what's been done. Um, you need someone that can help arrange the swallow studies that you inevitably will be re, you know, recommending uh, and purchasing materials for meal modifications and, and safe meals that, that may include um, utensils and equipment of that sort. It could include um, seating equipment for children and then uh, things that you may need for oral motor therapy if you choose to do that. Um, so uh, that person will organize and provide and document professional development when the district does it and should be someone who is very knowledgeable about dysphagia as well as feeding disorders and can serve as a support and a consultant to the school-based SLPs and OTs with the cases. So if they have a case that they're not sure about, they can call that person in to kind of consult with them. And of course, to work with the parents and the school administrators whenever there are issues and concerns that don't yet need the help of a supervisor or special ed. Most cases will be handled by a feeding and team, uh, team administrator. So who is that person going to be in your situation? Do you need one, first of all? And who could that be? That might be part of your action plan. You might say, yes, we do need someone to function this way. And then write down some possible names or get in touch with people in your district that may know of who would be. Or if you're a person that would be interested, you could go to your district. Um, then what forms are you going to need? What forms would that uh, administrator need in order to really be efficient and to function the way you need them to? Will that person need additional training? Do you not have someone who has that knowledge and skills and experience in dysphagia and, and feeding disorders? Will that person need some updating of skills? And will that person need more time or an adjusted caseload? So, in the example of my case, I was at the time that we established this coordinator of speech and language therapy. We formed a committee, we got you know, the procedure going. And once we did that, it was um, my job was to administrate the swallowing and feeding teams. Um, I just added it to my workload. It wasn't something that um, they needed to hire someone to do or add uh, additional time for other people. Um, 
in the role that I was in, I was able to monitor my own time and I could fit this in. So you may have someone, a related service, an OTR speech coordinator that could function in that way without really adding a position. For me, and I was a large school district, we had 120 uh, speech language pathologists and we had about 40 occupational therapists and we followed 200 students for swallowing and feeding. And it really didn't require more than maybe two half days a week for, for me to manage it. So once you get that whole administrative piece worked out, um, and you may already be able to check that off. I did give you a checklist that you can go through that will follow what we're talking about today. So you can kind of go back and say, okay, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this. The next step I think would be to kind of identify your preferred team model, because to really get going, you need to know where the teams are going to be based and are, you know, how is it all going to be set up? is who, who's gonna be on the teams? Who will serve as a team leader? Will it be the SLP who is at the school full time or will it be the OT who comes and who is going to be the person to oversee the procedure to make sure that it is done with fidelity? Um, and so in order to the, do that, um, you know, uh, you're gonna to have to look at your personnel. So will you also include a consultant? someone who can travel around and help people get going to build their capacity. That's a very effective method and something you might wanna consider. Will caseloads need to be redistributed? I can almost guarantee that they would. If you're taking on swallowing and feeding um, and it is time consuming, the people who are dressing swallowing and feeding may need to have a slightly smaller caseload and the others who are addressing your more typical occupational therapy duties or speech therapy duties would maybe carry a little bit larger caseload. Um, so will there, you know, what is that gonna look like? And for those of you, uh, primarily OTs that travel to many different schools, it may look different for each of your settings. So you may have to have a, a plan for three or four or more settings to see what each one is going to look like. Um, and then will some therapists only see the really severe cases where you have teams that focus more on our medically complex and more severely involved in handicapped children? Or will they each team cover whatever is in their location? That's another question to be answered. So how do you determine the team model that will work for you. You survey the knowledge and skills and experience of your SLPs and your OTs in the areas of swallowing and feeding disorders. I have included in the handout a survey that you can use to begin sorting through this. You want to know with SLPs, what is their knowledge, what is their level of knowledge and skills in dysphagia? Do they have a graduate, graduate level course and did they participate in practicum in graduate school? Do they have any experience in the hospital settings in nursing homes and home health? How many currently at this point have the knowledge and skills to begin addressing swallowing and feeding? They won't all say they do because they all don't. Um, they would need to have some experience and some training. So how many do you have in your programs that you can partner with that will be ready to work with you? How, how many have some skills, and this will be most of them, but need to update those skills and the train? what is the training they need in order to feel like they can move forward? Um, and then how many have absolutely no knowledge and skills in swallowing? And what would be the plan for them? Can they take additional cases? So the ones that are addressing swallowing and feeding have more time to dedicate to the more difficult swallowing cases. And then let's look at OTs. What is their level of knowledge and skills in dysphagia? If they have the knowledge and skills, if they've had a graduate level course and practicum, um, you know, then they're ready to go possibly. How, have they, uh, how many have worked with feeding disorders, sensory motor disorders, behavior feeding disorders? Is this a strength area for them? Um, or will they need additional training on that? 
how many have the knowledge and skills to begin to work as a team member to address these feeding disorders immediately? Then let's look at physical therapists. How many know the position issues that surround eating and feeding in the children that we serve? Are they ready to help position children for feeding? Most of them will be, um, but some may need to brush up on some of the skills of uh, feeding in particular and what is the necessary positioning to help children to really not only swallow safely, but to really be a little more efficient and um, able to be more independent based on how they're positioning. Position, positioning is such an important piece that pulling in those PTs to really look at their positioning during meal times is good. So they may need some specific training in that area, which they can seek out through uh, many uh, avenues. And then our school nurses. Um, I, I, at the beginning of our discussion, uh, Deborah and I were talking, they said in some districts, the nurses aren't involved at all. And, you know, this is unfortunate because nurses come to the table with things that we need when we're addressing swallowing feeding, but they may not have had a lot of training with dysphagia. They may not really feel that comfortable with it. So do they need to get some training in that area? When we started years ago, our nurses did not know at anything at all about dysphagia. Well, several years later, it's now in their operational manual for the state. So, you know, we can make changes by pulling people in and getting, but as a SLPs and OT, we don't want to do the job of the school nurse. Um, so what is the plan for training them to be active team members, to know the signs and symptoms of swallowing the disorders and to know the medical risk and the medical risk that maybe lead up to a child now having a swallowing problem. So we, we have them at our interview with the parents because they can listen to that medical history and really pull out some information that as therapists, we maybe aren't quite as good at. They also can really become involved with undernutrition and dehydration, which is so common with our children with swallowing and feeding disorders, where they can train the staff to recognize undernutrition, a child that's heading towards undernutrition or dehydration, and then to talk to the parents and really get that child in a better place. School nurses are essential, as is all of our core team members. So then establish a plan for updating the knowledge of skills for the core team members. Some will need more than others, okay? But try to begin the training immediately. Offer a basic course on pediatric dysphagia, either by bringing in a speaker, using a staff that experienced, if you have someone really trained and experienced that can put on a presentation or purchase a webinar to view as a group. Um, so this uh, is something that your district probably should finance and should be willing to provide if they're requ requiring this as part of your workload. And so for those that need a graduate level course, uh, the district can investigate in university programs that will work with the school district to train personnel. We did that with Southeast Louisiana University twice and it worked out very nicely. Um, also, each professional has a responsibility for their competency when it's, in, when it's uh, necessary to perform their job. And when your school district says, we want a team of SLPs, OTs, PTs, and school nurses to start addressing swallowing and feeding, it is within the scope of practice of those professionals, then those professionals cannot plead a lack of knowledge. They can't say, well, I just don't know how to do it, so I'm not gonna do it. That is unethical. You wouldn't do that with another pro area that you work on as an OT or a speech pathologist. And so you certainly can't do it with feeding. If, you're, if it's become part of your workload, it is part of your scope and uh, sequence, then you have a real responsibility to educate yourself and to get those skills that you need. So um, it should be required for all professionals working with dysphagia. 
So this is a survey that I give to school districts. You can tweak it, make it more specific to your programs and your needs, but it basically just makes sure that everyone is fully licensed and have find out, do they, have they had a graduate level course? When was it taken? Did it address any pediatrics? Um, have you had any practicum? And have you ever worked in a medical setting where dysphagia was part of your job? Explain. Um, have you attended additional professional development training? Which of course, all of these wonderful ones that deborah has been offering could go on your particular list. And describe your strengths and weaknesses in the area. So I've included this uh, particular survey as part of your handouts so that you can really put that, if that's part of your uh, action plan, is to seek out who are the trained professionals and then who aren't and where do you need to go from there, you'll have that available. And then of course, a record of their um, uh, professional development to document that. So when we look at our team members, the, re the personnel requirements are like a pyramid. Um, to me, I prefer, I think best practice is the school-based team model, where the SLP, the OT, the PT, and the nurse who are assigned to that school for everything else also address swallowing and feeding. However, that model takes more trained personnel than any other model. So it, it offers great rewards, but it takes a time to get to that model. In between, your district or your school system, what, wherever setting you're working in, could have a combination team model where they use the professionals that are ready to go for their schools. And then any school that does not have those trained and experienced professionals would then be served by a core team that would travel to their school, set up safe eating plans and train the, the school staff and continue to monitor uh, during the course of the year. Um, so the combination team model begins to build that capacity. That's where we started. Now we're totally school-based, but many districts can start with a com. They may have 50% of their schools that have trained people. And then uh, gradually as they hire new people and as they conduct trainings and they use mo uh, mentoring, they build that capacity to expand it to more schools so that they're working towards the standard of a school-based team. And then you have your core team member, which is a, a panel of professionals that are experienced and trained in dysphagia and, and feeding disorders. And they go to every school, set up the safe swallow plans, work with the parents, work with the school team, work with the physicians. And so this would probably be their job. And um, then they set up a schedule for monitoring and um, checking on the students. Uh, this works for many districts that have just very few people that are able to do it, and, but they have a very enthusiastic couple of teams that would do it. So it wouldn't have to be just one core team, you could have two or three core teams to divide up the workload. And it's a good, uh, it's a very viable option for many districts. And then I know some districts that simply have one person, uh, the ones that I know of are SLPs, but it could be the other way, it could be OTs as well, who set up the, who go to each school and set up safe swallow plans for every student in the school, working with the school-based personnel to get that going. And of course that takes the fewest number. So um, deciding which team model will work or models, you may have more than one, would work for your district um, is a real important part to getting started. Um, so think about your current situation and do you, can you clearly see where you might find your district, your, your school setting, um, which team model would work for you? Um, if you already know, then that is checked and you move on. If you don't, then that might, be, that might warrant a committee discussion of how it can be done. So once you've identified the number of therapists, 
you know, how many do you have ready to go? And um, do you have enough for a school-based metal model? Or do you know? Now I have uh, given you as part of your handout, the team model summary sheet, which really talks about the benefits and challenges of each model as well. Then a swallowing and feeding team must be assigned for every school in the district, even though some schools may not have cases at this time. And this is one of those proactive safety things that we do so that we know that if a child all of a sudden at Maple Elementary comes up with a swallowing problem, we're not uh, running around trying to put together a team. We already know who is the team. It's either gonna be a core team that comes in or a school-based team that we're ready to go to help that child have a safe meal time. So it's one of those really proactive things we do in the procedure that I'm talking about and have been talking about all year. We wanna cut down any um, possibility that a child would be overlooked or that uh, we won't be able to set up a safe plan in time. We want to reduce the risk by using the procedure being organized with our teams and setting it up. Um, so, and then of course, you also assign a team leader and that's a person who will keep track of the procedure, make sure it's being followed. This is the form I used uh, for our swallowing and feeding team. Uh, I would list the school and then the SLP, the OT, the nurse and the PT who were responsible for that school. If you have one core team, then you're only gonna have one team listed. But in many cases, you'll either have two or three core teams, or you may have a combination teams. It could be a little more complex. And what you want is to give this to everyone in the every school, every therapist in the uh, in your school district, so that everyone knows who the team is at that particular school, at any school. So if I'm a therapist and I know that a child that I've been working with for safe eating. Uh, is moving across the district to another school, I just have to look up the name of that school and know who to send that information to, who to call and talk to or email and let them give them a heads up that this student has a safe plan that's coming. So you can see how by doing these kinds of things, you're really reducing the risk that so many children have during mealtimes at school. So, um, it's a simple table, anyone could have made it, but I made it, so I give it to you. If you don't like it, you can fix it. <laughs> um, okay, now do we have any questions yet, Deborah? The one that I have, someone asked me to post for them, um, do I need to get a new consent form signed by the family before each reassessment of the environment the student will eat in? Um, and so not a new evaluation, but a new reassessment of the, um, of the cafeteria or whatever the environment is. Okay, so when you're talking about health and safety issues in a school setting, um, you don't necessarily get parent permission. You certainly involve the parents, you work with the parents, you inform the parents, but ultimately your decision on uh, what you, how you're going to feed that child at school in order for them to stay safe is the responsibility of the school district. Uh, so we, and this is, and, and I know it's going to depend on what your district tells you. Um, they may say, no, you must get parent permission every time you look at a child's feeding and swallowing skills. Um, I do not believe you need to do that. That is not what I tell my schools. Um, it is driven by um, information we receive from our school board attorneys. Um, so if you rely on parent permission and a parent does not give it to you, if they will not give you the permission to feed the child the way you feel is necessary for that child to be safe at school, then the district is put in a very difficult situation. They've asked permission but they're not getting it. So do they continue to feed the child in a way that they know is not safe? Where do they go from there? So we take that piece, it, it, it's, it's the responsibility of the school. And so the school is uh, 
going to feed the child the way they are they determine to be safe. Now, your district may not be. Linda, able. go ahead, Linda. Uh, Linda's our uh, resident expert on all things uh, uh, legal uh, in our schools. <laughs> Good, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, in Oregon, we really do strongly, strongly encourage um, school districts to get that consent from the parents. But within that consent, the parents need to be fully informed of why you're doing that. You're you're wanting to do this evaluation so you understand the child's feeding and swallowing needs. Um, you want to make sure you have safety in place. So really emphasizing that safety. And unless we're able to do that evaluation, it might be, I know some school districts have said, well, then a parent needs to come feed your child, um, but we're not going to be able to use our team to safely feed your child unless we do this consent. And the parent can be there for the evaluation. So it's all around transparency. But if we don't have that, then it's jeopardizing. Do we really know what to do that's safe? And what, from what I've seen, Linda, even if the school says that the parent can come in, that the school is still responsible for the safety of that student, even if they have allowed a parent to feed mm -hmm. them in the manner that they do at home. So the liability, I think, is yeah. still there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one thing that I don't think administrators under, always understand. The liability just slightly less with the parent sitting there actually engaging and doing the feeding than if the child's not getting fed at all. Yeah, Deborah, you have that actually in your that your training book that you you know the feeding and swallowing that it's an actual OAR that says that the parent um, it doesn't release them of liability if mm -hmm. this feeding takes place in the school setting and mm -hmm. they should be trained by the OT or SLP depending on who. Provides, yeah. and long that's long where that's feeding, what I had pulled from yeah. when I made that comment. Yes, as long as they're feeding the thank child, you, Lynn. According to the recommendations by the school team, that's one thing. But to come and feed the child in a way that the district does not feel is safe does not release the district. And mm -hmm. hiring a private nurse to come in and feed the child, that does not release the responsibility. Now, I always recommend avoiding the term swallowing evaluation because it's so tightly tied to eligibility in the schools and the requirement of parent permission and two weeks of this and that. It is not the same thing. We are really going through the process of identifying how to safely feed the child at school. Mm -hmm. So it is a school responsibility that truly does not require that parent permission. But I am completely with you that mm -hmm. we need to pull those parents in. We need to work with them. We want them to agree with what we're doing and be comfortable with how we're feeding their child. And I would say in a large majority of the cases, that happens. We either already feed the child the way the parents are, or they understand why we have to make the modifications and they're on board, but they never sign permission um, because we will need to go ahead. Now, what our school board attorneys told us is that when a parent requests something, so let's say we come up with a safe eating plan, they request a different texture, a different position, something else. Um, the school board uh, is required at the IEP to consider the parents' suggestions mm -hmm. and to put that in the GSI of the uh, IEP. And once they've considered it, they do not have to go by that suggestion. They can still go by what their team felt was the best way to feed the and safest way to feed that child at school. But as long as they've acknowledged it, considered it, and then they put and documented it. Document, document, document. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, Linda, was there anything else that you wanted to add to that? Um, other than, and I don't know if maybe you've provided this, but maybe a sample of what that um, consent to do that um, swallowing observation. You just said it so eloquently. If we had a, a sample like that, that would, might be a good um, template to use. Thank you. So, so you're talking about the um, statement on the IEP type of thing? Yeah. You no, know, seeking that consent from the parent. Okay. You, I used the word assessment. You had a much better way to um, phrase oh, okay. it. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. 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 So again, always getting consent or having the conversation, being on the safe side, uh, but just also knowing too that um, if you're, if, 
consent is there and there's disagreements that um, that it still comes back to safety and uh, you know in, in addition to that of course responsibility liability um, mm -hmm. and it, and sometimes we feel that the parent how can the parents say no to something when it's all about the safety I think some of us scratch our heads with that but it is uh, it has to be part of the conversation and again documented yeah. you know when you're working with parents they have so much going on with these children and we don't really know where they're coming from. You know, it may, they may take it personally that we don't think they're feeding the child safely. They may not like that this might single out the child more. You just aren't sure. So it's good to talk to the parents, work with them, really see why they're hesitating to let us do this. But when we talk about that safety, we're not just talking about feeding and swallowing. If the school district for a child's safety needs to put him in a different classroom or a different setting or limit access to certain things, they have the right to do what keeps the child safe at school because ultimately it is the district's responsibility. And I, I think that um, feeding and swallowing is a little more difficult sometimes because feeding is such a personal thing for a parent. Uh, so we must be careful how we work with parents. We really have to be so careful talking to them. And we certainly appreciate their role. And many of them join us at our conferences. And, and that's wonderful because everybody needs to be at the table. And sometimes it feels like there might be some friction when there's disagreement. But again, following your licensure, following what you know is safe um, and documenting it is always going to be your best policy. It's much easier to defend a decision based on your training, your experience, your knowledge, and the safety of the child than it is to follow what someone else tells you to do, but not be able to support it with your, your knowledge and skills. So keep that in mind. Okay, so we're gonna move on now to the next step in getting started in your situation. And that is to train classroom teachers and paraprofessionals. Now, everyone participating in the school has to be trained on the procedure itself. So you wanna train all stu teachers with students and paraprofessionals with those students in the classroom. You wanna let them know what a swallowing feeding disorder is, what the signs and symptoms are, the procedures. We've talked about this. You wanna train each individual and paraprofessional on each student's safe eating plan. And that's usually done primarily by the SLP with the OT training and equipment and PT on positioning or however your team is set up. Um, so classroom staff members really must be trained on the basic information of swallowing disorders. And of course we had a whole session on that and the step-by-step -step procedure and not in detail. Teachers don't need a great amount of detail. Just say, this is a step. This is how it's going to flow. This is what's going to happen. Um, the core team will need detailed training, but not the um, classroom staff. And then they really need to know the individual roles and responsibilities of all team members, including a more detailed training on their professional role. So it's important that they know who's responsible for what so that they can call on them when they have a question or a need. Um, so the core team will then need a more detailed training on each step of the procedure. So that includes what is each step? What is the form that is associated with it, and how do I complete that form? Um, who's responsible for completing the form? Will it be the same person completing every form or will you kind of farm that out to different team members? And they need to understand why each step is important and why it's essential to follow every step as you go through this. So it's so important that we take seriously the risk factors in setting up a swallowing and feeding plan and that we know that it's important to cover all of these little areas to cut down the risk of a child choking at school or getting sick through aspiration pneumonia. So um, they also, the core team also needs that extensive training on their roles and responsibilities and um, those of all team members and um, how they 
are going to, what, what, is there, what are they going to do once you get the procedure started? You want to review working with parents as we were just discussing. That is one of the most important things we have to do. And if you really want to limit the contentious situations, begin working with those parents right away. Listen to them, acknowledge what they're saying. If you disagree, educate them, tell them why this particular situation isn't good for the child at school, which may be very different than at home. At home, they're with their family, they're at the, kid, the table with the family, the mother's there, uh, the same person is feeding them. At the school, they're in a noisy cafeteria, they may have different feeders on different days, they have different kind of food than the mother typically cooks, you know. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why it might be different. So working with the parents and of course trying to get those parents to give us access to the uh, student's medical team is also important. So for the procedural training, you're going to talk up for the core team, they need to know about the team approach, about the procedure. They need to understand the built-in redundancy and the importance of doing the procedure with fidelity. They need to know how to write a good, safe eating plan uh, that really addresses all of the students' needs that way. And then to be able to train the classroom staff. So learning how to train staff is equally important because you can have the best plan in the world, but if you don't train the student, the feeders well, then the plan won't be implemented correctly. And then what they need to do to maintain that safety. So once you've checked off the training piece or you've checked off a plan for, for the training, like say come this August when we go back to school, this is our plan for training classroom staff on the procedure. This is our plan for training core team members and for tr uh, training classroom staff on the staff plan. Then you have to go and start thinking about, well, what are we going to do with our cafeteria? What, you know, the food service program, as we talked about in other talks, is responsible for modifying a student with disabilities uh, school meal if it's required. Uh, so initially, if your school staff has not, if your cafeteria staff has not been modifying food, they're going to need some training. Now, the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative has some very good training videos, which uh, school cafeteria personnel can access and learn. Um, and it's at idsi.org. I have included in, um, let's see. I've included in your handout, I, I don't know, Deborah, I sent one today. <laughs> I don't know if you got to add that one, but I know you will. Oh, uh, I will go in and look. I didn't, okay. I didn't it, yet. I thought it might be helpful for you to have the comparison of the IDSI, the new uh, food mod uh, program they're using throughout the world, and the National Dysphagia Diet, which is what most of us were familiar with. Um, in the United States, which is um, la, the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, now, now I'm so used to it, I'm, I'm the mechanical chopped, the um, then chopped, you know, the diet you're used to uh, prescribing. So this will help you make that transition to the new way of doing it. So then step number four, um, is to identify the number of students at risk in your schools. Um, so when you start- Emily, for clarification, yeah. was that IDDS? I, IDDSI. Okay, thank okay. you. And yeah, and then the other is the NDD, the National Dysphagia Diet. And, and I mean, some people are still using NDD, but the push and the transition is really to the IDSI. Um, okay, so now you want to, how do you, if you've never, now you, you, and you're going to be at all different levels here, but if you're just starting and you've never addressed swelling and feeding, um, then this is what you're going to need to do. You're going to need to be ready to implement the procedure once you've identified the students at risk. So you've done your training, you need to be ready. Uh, you can can you begin with the most severely involved children or students who already have some modifications? Can you get the teams ready to go and then they uh, identify by school, like all the teams converge on one school and get them all identified? 
it will be time intensive at the beginning because so many students will need to be evaluated and to have plans set up and IEP conferences and maybe uh, instrumental referrals. But you need to go about it systematically, rank the students you are most concerned about safety. Uh, and many of those will be oral phase dysphagia because those are the students we really worry about choking. And begin working with your parents immediately. Uh, what is the diet the students currently on at home? Begin there and know that you may have to mod modify it, but many children, it'll be fine. Um, so you can do one school at a time if you have a number of different teams and get them all done and then the teams move to another. You're going to have to think creatively of how you can get all your students done once you've identified them. So how do you go about identifying them? Well, well and I don't have that uh, handout. I don't see that I have anything that I got from you today. Okay. So um, uh, just if you just want to make notes, sorry to interrupt you. I was looking for it and didn't yeah. want to lose that thought because I've got so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> I I will definitely it's it's a handy tool. I will and so what is the name of it? It's a comparison of the IDC and the NDT. Okay, NDT. I, all right. I'll be looking I for it. Thank it around you. Around nine o'clock today, I thought I said it. Maybe I didn't hit set. I'll have okay. to look. <laughs> so, so. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. So how do you go about determining your students at risk? Um, you distribute the referral screening form that is part of the procedure, and you give it to classroom teachers, SLPs, OTs, who will complete it, uh, check the signs that they have observed, and that gives you a list of students with risk factors. You assign a team and a team leader to each student, which you've already done that if you followed the, the process we're talking about. And then the team leaders, you only need one person to really observe. This is a screening piece. You just observe that John and say, oh yeah, this looks like a good referral. Uh, this is the form, which I think you're pretty familiar with. And then you're gonna list all the students from that classroom that you've gotten are all the students on the OT's caseload that have these. Step number five is to begin implementing the procedure. So you might wanna have a consultant available to assist the therapists and the teams as they get started. Um, all of the safe eating plans, once they're written, should be turned into that swallowing and feeding administrator. Records are kept on each student and ongoing management of the procedure throughout the year happens. So you want to rank the students who are identified through the referral process that you're most concerned about. Observe the classes of students referred in the cafeteria and note which students are struggling the most or need more monitoring. So these are the ones where you're going to want to quickly get them set up with a safe eating plan because they're the ones that are most at risk. And it'll be only one time as you're getting started that you're going to do have this many students. After that, it's going to be ongoing referrals from teachers or therapists, and it won't be a big bundle of them. So ask teachers to complete the form, list the students who have been identified. The team leader observes each student during a meal time. They decide which classroom each team will begin with. They talk to the teachers about the order that the students will be addressed. They begin to call the parents of the most involved students. So you're talking triage here. <coughs> students most at risk done first. You want to send home the parental interview and then maybe set a day to get the form returned and talk to the parent. So basically you're starting the procedure, but you're kind of going with your most involved, most serious risk children at risk and going down the process. So then you discuss with the team when you wanna do the interdisciplinary observation and make sure you talk to your physical therapist ahead of time so that they've looked at the positioning for each of these students uh, that need physical therapy that, uh, so that when you do your observation, they're eating in an optimal position. So it's much better to get the parent uh, interview and to talk to the parents prior to conducting the interdisciplinary because the information you're going to get from those parents may really change how you view, view the child swallowing and feeding. If you remember when we talked about it, you're going to get a lot of the information you need on how to do that safe eating plan just by interviewing the parents, looking at their oral mechanism and their general observations. 
you know, finding out if there's some medical uh, history that needs to be followed up. Have they had a modified bearing swallow study recently? Can you get that report? So you really need to work with those parents and get a release to talk to physicians or private practitioners if that's indicated. Once you talk to the parents, then you prepare for the interdisciplinary. You check with the cafeteria manager to determine the meal for the scheduled day and to uh, ask for some modifications if you think you're going to need it. Um, and then this is the ITSI. Talk to the cafeteria about preparing texture modifications according to ITSI. And then you do the interdisciplinary. So the, the occupational therapist will want to be sure and bring some feeding equipment to try and see what is most effective for that child. Uh, is a low cup flow cup needed or is there another or is a straw better, you know, those kinds of things um, so that they can include that in the um, safe eating plan. The SLP should be ready to modify the meal or to use the modified meals foods provided by the cafeteria and try different textures that may result in safer or more efficient eating. So for example, a student on the CHOP diet, the therapist may try a minced and moist modification to see if the student is able to handle the texture better and not have to work so hard to eat a bite of food. So if you see that he's really chewing, 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 struggling to get it swallowed, a softer food will help them to be more efficient, to get in more nutrition during school and to uh, eat you know, without fatiguing. And so then that would go on their plan. Once the observation is completed, the team will discuss and hopefully they'll all be together and can talk about what each recommendation would be. So the safe eating plan is established and that includes positioning, sensory considerations, utensils, spoon placement, cup drinking, feeding, all these things we've talked about already. And then of course, you know that you must monitor your student to make sure that that swallowing plan continues to be appropriate. If you feel that that child is aspirating or at risk for aspirate pneumonia, then at the IEP, you want to discuss a referral to the physician for a swallow study. So if you're making a referral for a modify, you decide that you need it, um, you fill out the pre-MBS form, you, the clerical will schedule the study after a release is signed. The school team calls a hospital SLP to talk about the upcoming study and the school team representative attends the study and the report is sent. So as I've said many times, it's important for the school team to, someone from the school team to attend the study so that the person conducting the study knows and understands what the district needs. Parents don't always have the same concerns that we do. So it's helpful to have a representation there. And it also gives us important information about the strategies we've recommended and how effective they are. Uh, so it's used to examine the anatomy and physiology, to get more information on oral, pharyngeal, and esophageal phases of swallowing, and to guide our clinical di diagnosis of dysphagia and decision-making, and then to evaluate the effectiveness of our strategies on increasing student safety. As you know, I am a huge believer in forms and procedure. I think both of them protect students by establishing a soft, safe eating plan, limiting risk factors and having all steps documented and holding everyone accountable. So this is the student data form that I used. Um, it lists the students for its last name, the school assignment, the date the services began, the date of the student's current plan and the assigned team leader and then a space for notes. I have included this in your handouts as well. So I see Devin has unmuted himself. Devin, did you have something that you wanted to add or ask? I had to reconnect. Okay, glad you're here. Go okay. ahead, Emily, thank you. <laughs> okay, so basically this is just a summary of the procedure. So that's how you get started. And all of that is in the checklist and you, that you can go through and fill in and complete a plan of where, what are the areas you need to work on in your particular situation to get that high quality plan. Now, what we did this year, we began by talking about administrators and how important they are and what they need to know. We identified pediatric feeding disorders and the new classification system, and we discussed the importance of a team approach. 
We also talked about the students eat safely, follow the forms procedure, that as you know, you have those that procedure, you have those forms, you can modify and edit them to meet the needs of your district. Um, we also approached the topic of competency and training, which highlighted the importance of having the necessary knowledge and skills to address dysphagia and feeding skills. That is something we have has been an ongoing theme, training that is required to implement this procedure that we're recommending. And we identified the categories of feeding, feeding and swallowing disorder cases that are in the schools and how each category may be slightly different in how you approach them. We talked about some of the common barriers and challenges to providing the services that we know are necessary. And we talked about the fear of due process and administrative support for procedures and the lack of knowledge and time. And so today we went through the order and process for establishing a team procedure in your district. And you may begin wherever your district is. Um, so now um, I wanna talk a little bit about leadership Good leaders are made, not born. If you have the desire and willpower, you can become an effective leader. Good leaders develop through a never ending process of self-study, education, training, and experience. Now is the time for you to be a leader. Don't do the same old thing. Let's start doing things differently and better. Um, leadership is the art of motivating a group of people to act toward achieving a common goal. So it's not necessarily a position. So you may be a leader, but not in a leadership position. So the traits of effective leaders is that they inspire action. So we've talked today about establishing an action plan. So what are the organizational roadblocks in your system? And what can you do as a group to inspire action? Optimism. Good leaders are optimistic. Now, I don't know if you've ever worked with a leader who was not optimistic, but it can be quite a struggle. It's very um, difficult to see how things can get uh, accomplished when someone has a pessimistic attitude. So what can you do to spread optimism when working on this particular project? And then of course, integrity. Be honest, fair, candid, and forthright when discussing the issues around establishing a team. How can this team be most effective for the children you serve? Uh, are you willing to give a little for the benefit of the student and the district? And then support and facilitate the team. What can you do to get others to buy into the concept of a swallowing and feeding team? How can you get other professionals on cam campus to work collaboratively? Communicate, encourage all on the committee or team to share their thoughts and ideas. It's really important for everyone to contribute and keep an open mind and work towards being non-judgmental or inflexible. Let's be open to things that may come up in a group discussion. And then once the team or committee has discussed the issues and made a plan, make a decision, be decisive and go forward. So those of you here today, some SLPs, OTs, PTs, or nurses, some administrators, um, if you're here today, you've already taken a step towards being a leader in your district. You have a goal or a vision for children in your district to eat safely and efficiently while they're at school. And you're seeking out information on how you can make that happen. You are already functioning as a leader. Remember, success is a journey, not a destination. So leadership means reaching out to others, modeling new ways, talking and listening to others, encouraging them and building those partnerships that make for such a strong team, raising others up. Let's encourage people to be their best and inspiring change, which is what we're talking about. We are talking about major change in our workload and in what we do. So values that should remain steady in the winds of change are a strong, steady belief that children with swallowing and feeding disorders can have safe, efficient, and enjoyable meal times at school, that you can have a high quality feeding and swallowing services at school, you believe in a strong action plan for consultation and collaboration with classroom staff, core team members, administrators to really ensure effective implementation and belief in a strong advocacy on behalf of students and professionals for changing 
practice that will create the future we desire. Um, and it, a, a strong participation in processes and teams that are considering innovations related to establishing uh, safe meal times at school. So we're gonna finish with the six simple principles of leadership. First of all, I just think these are kind of fun. There is no such thing as time that doesn't count. All time counts. Never look back unless you intend to go that way. If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. You can't tell which way the train went by looking at the track. And the unexpected does happen. So be prepared for it, even if you don't know what it will be. And the art of leadership is making the impossible happen. And so I think that's where you guys are. Um, the districts that I've been associated with that have been most successful have decided as a group of concerned professionals that they needed to work together to help children with disabilities have safe meal times. These groups were so that were so successful were made up primarily of SLPs and OTs driving the efforts and the PTs and nurses also participating. They reached out to school administrators, usually a coordinator of related services, to assist them in working with upper administration. They took seriously the role of educating all along the way and included this. So they educated everyone, principals, classroom staff, supervisors, to, went through the process of really educating everyone. Uh, they took the procedures and forms that I provided and the ones I provided to you, and they used them to meet the needs of their district. So that meant that they added some forms that they felt that were necessary. They changed some of the forms that I provided or completely replaced them with their own forms. Some had already written safe eating plans that they preferred. Um, so that's totally okay. This gives you somewhere to start. You don't have to recreate everything, but you certainly can make changes that you need. And they did it together with the support of their administration. They had someone who oversaw the process and was responsible for setting up trainings, assigning teams and leaders, and keeping track of the students being followed and their plans. It was a process that took time for all of them. It increased their workload and they worked with the district administrators to redistribute caseloads so that those responsible for swallowing and feeding, identification and treatment had smaller caseloads or workloads and those who did not carried a larger workload. They provided professional development so they could update their knowledge and skills and lobbied for additional positions uh, on campus to address these needs oftentimes channeling the Medicaid funds that uh, these professionals already generate. And that money can be quite significant. So it's my sincere hope that these sessions have gotten you closer to where you would like to be in addressing swallowing and feeding, that the information and materials that I've provided to you move you towards providing that high quality swallowing and feeding services to the students in your district or districts that have those needs. And if you ever need additional information or need to discuss your situation, you know that you can contact me personally. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to have a take a few minutes to see where you are right now. Deborah, can we do the poll? Yes, we're going to ask Chandra to launch it. Okay. Looks like it's out there and uh, we'll give you a, a few minutes. If you see one and you answer other, uh, there's no way in the poll to uh, provide uh, more than a, a comment. So please feel free to put the comments other into the chat box. We'll give you a couple minutes for that. I believe these polls are anonymous. Is that correct, Deborah? Yes, it is. Okay. Are they completing them? I don't think it shows. There's there's just a few questions that's starting to come in. Yes. Okay. I can't, I can't see it. Uh, we are seeing that, yeah, they're starting to roll okay. in. People okay, were good. giving it some thought and that's Thinking good. It. Thinking about it, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. 
we've got about half of folks have uh, completed, so we'll give you more time for that. Emily, as they're finishing this um, poll, I just want to thank you for all your expertise in the framework and the structure that you've provided. You, you've provided us uh, a kind of a safety net of, you know, when we do have children with these types of concerns, you know, what do we do? And so I think in Oregon, we knew a lot about what we needed to do, but now we have a much stronger foundation um, that can give us confidence in what we're doing. So thank you for your support and guidance. Thank you. I really appreciate those words very much. And I do too. And thank you. That's from the Department of Education support from Linda. And Linda's always here with us. But I, I certainly agree with uh, what you're saying. And it has helped us. You know, we don't always start with professional development. Uh, we start with a community of practice. And I think this has helped us to take our professional development and really develop a community of practice that can continue on. So um, that's just so valuable. Valuable. Well, and I reached out to Fact Oregon this last week to talk about this following and the whole thing that we've done, the professional development, and they were absolutely thrilled that we were providing attention to this small group, a very important group of students. They are thrilled that the professional development is taking place. Um, they want to be able to um, tap into our website to be able to listen to some of these later, um, and so that are informing parents um, and then they're thinking of parents that could come along beside us and do a webinar like this from the parent perspective and also thinking about our following conference if we could have someone maybe join us there to give the parent perspective to all of this and so they are really thrilled about that they're looking at the angle from a parent that maybe has a preschool child and what that initial journey looks like and then maybe a parent that has like a junior high or high school that's been kind of a long-term swallowing feeding type of kid so um, great connections and great support that we're developing. Great ideas too. Really, mm -hmm. that sounds wonderful. So we're ending the poll. We've got the majority okay. of folks have completed it. If you are winding down, go ahead. Uh, but we're going to reveal that. And thank you, Linda, for that, because we know, again, we are so um, uh, blessed to have uh, organizations like FACT that can help us um, to to bring in that component. They sit on our boards, they are at our sessions, and and they are our partners. They are truly our partners. So Linda was asking them about a session for our, um, our echo feeding for next year. So I'm happy to talk about some of the other topics, but can you see the uh, yes. results? Very interesting, okay. I think they're pretty encouraging results here. I'll say. Don't you think? I think people who are somewhat or very comfortable is look yeah. at that number. I know. It's exciting. It's amazing. Yeah. I'm kind of wishing we had the pre on this to see where they were before they started uh, oh, joining yeah, us. That but would have been fun, right? Yes, <laughs> but you know, now we know. Um, and so lack of okay. Very good. Okay. I wonder what the other is on the um uh if you're not comfortable only somewhat, what is your main concern? Other was the largest. Uh, so whatever it was, I didn't guess. Well, um, uh, Melanie, would you like to unmute yourself? I think that the comments that you put in the chat are related to other. Um, sure. Um, so I have two different types of questions. We're in a large district and we have not yet been successful in establishing a relationship with our nutrition services, but we want to try. And I think it would be helpful if I could connect our department with another school district in Oregon that has been successful so that they can talk about this idea and how it works because so far we've gotten resistance. Hmm. My second question is, how do you manage the paperwork involving the team? Um, we've tried Google Drive, but I'm archiving medical um, information, the notes that we get, charts. Um, we're charting is what I'm calling it throughout the year, but I wanna save that in some systematic way. And, and as a district, we don't have, we haven't identified something that works for both general education and special education students. So those were my two others. Yeah. Uh, so the resistance from the cafeteria workers, uh, I mean, have you gone to the supervisor of food services? 
Yes, and that's where the resistance began. And what are they saying? I wasn't part of that discussion. A colleague yeah. was, and it was basically no. And I think it was due to lack of maybe knowledge. And mm -hmm. I, I can share that knowledge, but I think there's also a concern that we're trying to push the work off onto an already a team that's already working very hard in the buildings and that's not it but I want to collaborate with them and I think that that's the only missing piece we have currently in our district. So I have their their manual that they go by and it says really clearly that they are responsible for the food modifications for children with disabilities. It's right there in their uh, procedural manual. Their, their regulations, their federal regulations. Um, so if you email me and you would like a copy of that, I'll just uh, send it to you. Um, it was not something I thought everyone maybe needed, but I certainly would be happy to send it to you. And then uh, you can educate yourself or your team on what their responsibilities are and then move from there because they do have the, uh, they have to, they have to. And, you know, we can always go that route because the law are the, that is behind us, um, but also looking if uh, if you had someone, do you have an ally there? Uh, most of the time, if you, you know, most things are happening through partnerships. So if you had just one person, you could start on small uh, conversation. Well, what would we do here? Do you have the equipment for that? And just looking at some small conversation and developing that relationship uh, to help bring those cafeteria folks along. Does that make sense? I think it does. I absolutely think it does. And I think that, you know, really education is, it, they really may not understand what you're talking about when you say children with swallowing and feeding disorders, uh, but they certainly make accommodations for children with food allergies and uh, things like that. So it, it is within their scope. That's what they need to do. Now, the other question, I'm sorry, what was the other question? <laughs> I didn't write it down. It was about managing the, the paperwork or the documents. Oh, related. yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, uh, when I was in my school district, we just used paper, right? But I know now they've put it on some program that the district uses and everything's electronic, which I think they really like. Um, but I don't think it would be Google Docs. I can try to find out what that is, but it's probably a uh, district program that the district purchased for everything, you know, um, but the, your district may have something that you can embed your forms into is what I'm thinking. I could chime in. You might want to explore smart sheets. I know the Oregon Department of Education is using that a lot to um, kind of monitor processes um, as they go along and, and many people can access that. You, so you could have maybe a line for each student. So look at smart sheets. That might be something like that I think is probably what would work well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and was, was there any other? I no, I don't see other questions. Go ahead, Emily. What did you, you put the poll results back up? I didn't get number four. Okay, go ahead and share that again, um, Chandra, if you would. Sorry. Know, is it possible to send those results to me or I'm not familiar enough with this? Uh, I'm going to have to look and see um, how we are able to do that also. Um, I'm sure we can. Okay. Okay, so Deborah, this will help some in your training for next year. They need more info. Oop, I need it back. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Okay, so they need more information on really conducting those clinical evaluations. And I, that's understandable because that can be uh, a little complex, but even so it's a 35% um, and the same with the safe eating plan at 24%. At the oral mechanism, wow, that's a big one. And then the sensory motor. So those two are really, really big. And that makes sense to me, really. So did you get all of those? One more, wait. <laughs> okay, that's okay. I just wanted to flash up. I know that we are past time and we could yes. uh, stop recording um, at this point, Chandra. Um, but I just wanted to, for those who are still here, um, I'm going to share my screen 